All right, let's pray. I'll teach you another one now. Pray. Yeah, you all probably could have guessed that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the time we have to come together to sing praises to your name, Lord, to play around and act crazy. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we look into your word now to focus, to be able to understand the things that are right in front of us. I pray that you would help us to take them, apply them to our lives so that we can live more like you want us to live. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll remember, last week we, or, you know, if you weren't here last week, maybe you watched the video. If you didn't watch the video, then I'm going to remind you. Because last week we started out in the book of Judges. We went over the first two judges of Israel. Now, the judges were people that God brought up to rescue Israel when, when they got themselves in trouble. Um, explanation is this. When Israel came out of Egypt and got into the promised land, they, they started to populate, they started to cast, you know, uh, conquer other people and kick them out of the land, but they didn't do everything they were supposed to do. They didn't kick all the people out that they were supposed to. So these people started over time to kind of get a foothold back into Israel's land and then grow stronger and stronger. And sometimes they would rise up and they would conquer Israel, all of it or part of it. So whenever Israel was conquered, they would cry out to God and they would, God would raise up a judge to kind of gather everybody together. God would empower them and rescue them. Here's, here's kind of how it looked, the, the cycle that we went over. Israel would be, would be good, and then they'd get into sin. Remember, the, the nations that were still living amongst them had their own gods. And Israel would fall into the trap of worshiping their gods. They would turn away from the real one true God, and they would start serving other gods. What? Are you talking about statues? Something? Yeah. Okay. Statues, idols. They would worship in groves. They would worship trees. They would worship the sky. They'd worship fish. Literally, the... The Bible records there was one God that the Philistines worshipped that was a fish. They made this big statue of a fish. And so they would worship all these different things. Things that weren't gods. I mean, okay, who likes to fish? Okay, how many of you have ever been fishing, and I know who's going to raise their hand on this one. Let me finish the question. How many of you have ever been fishing, and when you caught that fish, you set the fish on top of the cooler or had somebody else hold it, and then you started bowing down to the fish, saying, oh, great fish, please answer my prayer. And you started asking it for things, and somehow I knew. Okay, there was one more. Who else? Who was the other one? Raise your hand. Okay, I knew those two were going to raise their hands. Um, we have cereal hand raisers. They're like, yes, me. What was the question? Oh, cereal raisers. So they would, Israel would turn away from God and they would sin. They would go into sin. Okay? And then down here, the next step in the cycle is they would be oppressed. That means other nations would conquer them. Remember I told you basically the summer thing was whenever the weather got good, nations went to war. It's just what they did. Who are we going to fight this year? And so when they would go to war, they would be conquered and either they would be taken off to be captives and servants to the, the nation that had conquered them, or that, that nation would come and occupy Israel's land. So they would be oppressed. And then, after however many years, sometimes the Bible tells us how long it was, sometimes the Bible doesn't, they would repent. And they would cry out to God and say, God, please rescue us. They would repent, which means they would, basically that's like saying you're sorry, but that's also changing your actions, changing your behaviors. So it's not just saying, God, I'm sorry, please rescue me. It's, God, I'm sorry, I will worship you, going to continue to worship God, and then once they repented, then God would deliver them. God would raise up a judge. And that's what we're studying, is this right here. This whole cycle, and this is where the judge comes in, is the deliverance. That's who God would bring around to rescue them from their, uh, from their oppressors. Remember, the first one we studied was Othniel. Othniel, great great baby name. And uh, Othniel, God, he was like the first action hero for Israel. He raised up, God raised him up and he conquered all these people, led a great army, delivered Israel um, out of their oppression first. The second, and really we didn't even get into this the way I wanted to, but it was a man named Ehud. The names just keep getting better. E-H-U-D. Ehud. 
Okay? My first son was going to be named that, but my wife had something to say about it. Um, so Ehud, remember Ehud was a lefty. So, and the whole thing with Ehud, the thing that made Ehud so great, and you, y'all should really go back and read this for yourself because we don't have time to get into it all tonight, but Eglon, the king that was oppressing them, was fat. Like, morbidly obese fat. Because the Bible tells us that when Ehud went in, you know, he, he got to have a little conference with Eglon, and he goes, hey, I got a secret to tell you. And so Eglin sends all the, all the guys out. And Ehud comes up and, and like gives him a little gift and then takes out the, the dagger 20-something inches long. This wasn't a dagger. This was like a little sword. So he takes it off his, out of his thigh and just stabs the dude. Bible says the thing... Yeah, it wasn't a dagger. That was a 21-inch sword. Um, so... The Bible says that the dagger went in so far that it took the, you know, the whole handle and everything. Just into, he killed the dude. This turned into a chubby dude shish kebab. Yes, that's exactly what it was. Hold on, hold on, because we got to get through this so we can get into tonight's lesson. So God used Ehud. God used Ehud to rescue the second time. The, the last one in chapter 3 we didn't get to was Shamgar. Exactly one verse devoted to Shamgar. The, the first name in this whole chapter that I actually like. Shamgar. That's pretty cool. Um, Shamgar, verse 31. This is, this is what the Bible says about Shamgar, okay? The Bible says, verse 31, And after him, that's after Ehud, was Shamgar of the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines, please stop talking, Slew of the Philistines, 600 men with an ox goad, and he, delivered, he also delivered Israel. So, we don't know a whole lot about Shamgar, okay? The Bible doesn't tell us anything except that Shamgar fought against the Philistines and he killed 600 men with basically a cattle prod, okay? Something you'd like, these days we would have like a little electric end on it, we'd zap the cows in the butt, zzz, go. Uh, he would, back then it was just a stick, so basically, he took a stick that they used to make cattle go the way they wanted, and he beat 600 men to death with it. This is not a cat you'd want to meet in the back alley, okay? Here's, here's the thing. Can, can I just enlighten us for a second? It really wouldn't have mattered what weapon he used to defeat the Philistines. Because God, the, the thing is, in these verses, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, the, the, that God used them, God directed them. The Bible tells us that each of these judges, God uses and God empowers. So God has a purpose and a plan. He has a job for them to do. And so He gives them the strength, the knowledge, and the ability to do the job. And if God wanted Shamgar to kill 600 men, it didn't matter if Shamgar had an ox goad, a sword, or a flip-flop. Okay? He was going to kill those men. He, you ever eaten so many marshmallows you felt like you were going to die? Mm. Okay. So y'all, y'all get the point. Y'all get the point. It didn't matter what he used. It doesn't matter the weapon he used to kill him. The, the point is, he rescued Israel by killing those men in the power of God with whatever he found close. And we're going to get to, in Judges, we're going to get to Samson, who really just used whatever he wanted. I mean, he killed men with donkeys' jawbones, and he killed men with his hands, and he, uh, he did all kinds of weird stuff. Okay, Well, we'll get to that, but... The, the power was not in the weapon. The power was in the Spirit of God upon the man. Okay, now, on into chapter 4. The next, the next time that Israel sins. Now, Israel was good under, um, under Ehud, before Shamgar. The Bible says for four score years. Eighty years they had peace. And then we get to this next one in chapter 4. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. Um, So once again, remember we saw last week that God literally, the Bible uses the word sold like, like Joseph was sold into slavery. God basically, what the Bible is saying is God sold them out. They turned their back on him, so he turned his back on them. He allowed them to be conquered by another nation. So he sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. So Israel was oppressed. They were conquered by Jabin, who was the king of Hazor. And he reigned over them for 20 years. Now, um, last week, the two we saw were... um, The first was eight years. The second was... Uh, 18. Where'd you see that? Where'd you see it? Verse 12. She's guessing. Did she get it right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's some, yeah, 18 years. End of verse 14 Whoa. in chapter 3. Um, so what you see here is 8 years, 18 years, 20 years. It's taking Israel longer and longer to call on God. For It's taking them longer and longer for the punishment to take effect and them to go, you know what, this really sucks. I should, this isn't good. We really should stop doing what we're doing and start doing what's right. Um, when, uh, when Jonah was very young, uh, my, my son has always had a very strong will and a strong dislike for vegetables. Um, sometimes dinner time, sometimes dinner time would last a very long time for Jonah because my wife would just try and get him to eat one green bean. Like, you will eat the one green bean. And she would jam it into his mouth and he would spit it back out. And this would go on for quite a while. She would do this and he would get punished. And then he'd go back to the seat because it doesn't end with the punishment. It ends with the compliance, with the obedience. So, yeah, you get punished and then you go back to the seat and you have to eat one green bean. One. So this would go on. The back and forth. Punishment. Eat a green bean. Punishment. Eat a green bean. Spit it out. Punishment. Eat a green bean. Spit it out. For what? What was (laughs) this is marathon meal, people. Until finally he ate enough of the green bean for his mommy to go, okay. You swallowed some of the green bean, we're both done. <laughs> and then it was bed, because it was probably about midnight. Um, <laughs> but it took... But it took so long for it to get through to him that, you know what, if I just do what my mother is asking me to do, this will be over. And now... Now, we don't have that much trouble with Jonah, very much, getting him to eat vegetables anymore. Not nearly as much as we did, because he learned something. He learned that if I just eat the vegetables they give me, I can get down and play faster. Israel is learning a lot slower that if I'll just do what's right, this junk won't happen. Eight years, 18 years. 20 years, and so they're conquered and oppressed by Jabin for 20 years. Anybody in here 20 years old? Mm -hmm, I I knew. (laughs) Hannah raises her hand and looks to see if Justin's got his up. Yeah! So, they were in bondage longer than most of you are old, than all of you are old. Can you imagine if if you had been born to someone, your, your parents had had you right after this had happened, until you were 20 years old, you would know nothing but having some foreign king reign over you. You wouldn't know the, the provision of God. You wouldn't know what it's like to be free. 20 years. That's because their parents were stupid. Get the point. Okay. 
So, they were conquered by Jabin. The Bible tells us that Jabin's general was a man named Sisera. 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 And the children of Israel, finally, after 20 years, look in verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3. 4, verse 3. Chapter 4, verse 3. And the children of Israel, I, I put, finally cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, that's Sisera, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So finally, Israel gets the point. Um, and they come, the Bible tells us in verse 4, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Now, Deborah is the first woman judge of Israel. Ta-da! See the little heading there? Uh, and she has herself a sidekick. So she's judging Israel this time. Verse 5, And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the Mount of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. They come to her and cry out to God through her. Okay? So she calls for Barak. And uh, verse 6, and she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, of Kedish Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee to the river uh, Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So she calls Barak and says, Here's what God said. You need to go down there to Mount Tabor, and I'm going to bring the king's general to you with all of his army and all of his, the Bible says, multitude. You know how many is in a multitude? A lot. A lot. If this is not like, oh, he's coming with his ten best friends, okay? This is like, he's coming with... Uh, would y'all stand still so I can count you? Like, tons of people. He's coming with his army. And, he's, and Barak's only taken 10,000 men. Deborah says, it's okay. You need to go because God said go. And God's going to give you the victory. Barak's response. Um, verse 8, And Barak said unto her, If thou go with me, I will go. But if thou will not go with me, then I will not go. This is a real secure man. Um, Honey, I'll go if you go. But if you don't go, I ain't going. That's me. Okay. We're not told if Barak was any kind of relation to Deborah. We don't know. We know he's not her husband, but we know that she had to hold his hand so he would go. Okay, come on, let's skip along. And we'll go down there and you can lead the army. This is, this is the man leading the army, okay? Like, I'm going to lead 10,000 men. Hold my hand. So... He says he won't go with Deborah unless Deborah goes with him. So, verse 10, And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went with him because he needed his security blanket. So, so in, in verses 14 and 15, the Bible tells us that God delivered Sisera's army just like Deborah had said. Now, it's important that you, you notice in verse 4, the Bible says, first, Deborah was a prophetess. What does a prophet do? Preaches. No. It tells, the word, it tells messages from God. A prophet... Does a prophet predict the future? No. Kind of. Okay, who says yes? Kind of. Who says no? Who says I'm not voting? Wow. Does a prophet, like the prophets in the Bible, do they predict the future? No. Yes? Not voting. No. no. Who's not voting? Why? Okay, what does a prophet do? Good answer. I don't even know what that look was. Okay. Um, how many of you knew that there was a tropical depression in the Yucatan Peninsula? Tropical storm actually got named Barry. Yeah. That's my dad's That's name. Your daddy. Um, okay, what? Oh, did you know? Oh, I knew. Um, okay. Oh, the weatherman predicted that 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 storm was coming because of the patterns of weather that he saw. So he's predicting 
what it was going to be. And have you ever seen on the Weather Channel or whatever, they have those lines where the hurricane's going to go. It's going to go out here, then it's going to turn and go this way. You seen that? They're predicting where the weather is going to go. They're trying to predict the future. That's not what a prophet does. A prophet doesn't predict the future because he doesn't know the future. A prophet tells the truth. And that's it. Now, this prophetess, Deborah, she was told by God what was going to happen. So God gave her truth. God didn't tell her that I'm going to tell you the future. Now, what God told her was going to happen in the future, yes. But all she did was tell the truth that God gave to her. So she tells Barak that this is going to happen. This is what you need to do. If you'll do this like God said, then you're going to win. And it happened. She didn't predict the future. She just told God's truth. Okay, so it happened just like God told Deborah it would happen. Verses 14 and 15, And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. It is not the Lord gone out before thee. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera. Now that word discomfited is very strange, because we don't use it anymore. But discomfited, if you were discomfited by someone else, that means you got your butt kicked. Okay? It's just that simple. Now, that's probably in the Message Bible, but it's not in this one. Okay? <laughs> and something about Twinkies. Um, but, um, ah, settle down. Okay, so, let me, let me give it to you in the, the King Gordon English here. Barak went down with 10,000 men, and he really kicked Cicero's butt. Okay, and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword. And if you get your butt kicked with the edge of the sword, it's not a good day for you. All right, just saying. Um, and so that Sisera, it was so bad that Sisera, the general, he lighted down off his chariot and he fled away on his feet. Okay, so Sisera got his butt kicked. Now, after this, Sisera, is, he runs away. Okay, his army's beaten so badly that he's like, I'm out of here. And he runs away. Now, I skipped a part, and I kind of did it on purpose. Um, the way Barak reacted when Deborah told her the truth of God, he said, I'll go, but only if you go with me. Like, I don't have the desire or the courage to do this on my own. Okay? And so Deborah tells him something. She said, I'll go with thee, Notwithstanding, um, the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Um, so she says, look, this could have been your victory, Barak, but because you wouldn't go without me, God's going to use a woman to defeat Sisera. Now, look at verse 17. Sisera fled away on feet to, a, to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber. Um, for he was at peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera. She came out of her tent to meet him and said, Turn in, my lord, and, uh, and fear not. And he went into the tent and turned into her in the tent, and she covered him with a mantle. So she comes out, sees Sisera running away. Now she's not dumb. She knows what's going on and knows that his army has been defeated. So she says, Come on in here, come on in here. Come in here and I'll hide you. And so he goes in, she throws a blanket over him, right? And so he tells her, look, if anybody comes looking for me, just stand at the door. If anybody comes by and says, is there anybody around here? Just tell them, no, there's nobody around. That's, that's the King Gordon version of all this. Um, so he, he gets comfortable. He's tired. And so he asks her for some water. He's been fighting all day and running away at the end of the day. And so he says, can you get me something to drink? So she... Instead of bringing him water to drink, she brings him milk. Y'all know what warm milk does? It puts the baby to sleep. Okay, so she brings him milk and makes him comfortable and puts the blanket over him. And he goes to sleep. Now, the Bible tells us that Jael and, his, and her husband were at peace with Jabin, the, the king that was ruling over Israel. But she doesn't act like someone that really liked the King Jabin a lot. Because look what she does. Um, 
verse 21. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail from the tent. She took a tent spike. Took it and a an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him. While he's sleeping, she tiptoed. Okay? She went softly. Um, and she smote the nail in his temples and fastened it into the ground. For he was fast asleep. Okay. You want to talk about killing somebody? <laughs> um, Haley, didn't you say you had a headache earlier? This dude had a headache. Okay. Um, reenactment. Dude's sleeping. She takes the tent spike. And nailed his head to the ground. And then she goes back outside the tent. And just kind of waits. Okay, somebody's going to be coming sooner or later. And she sees the armies of Israel and waves them out. Hey! I think I got who you're looking for. Come on. And they, she brings him into the tent. And they go and go, oh, yeah, that's him. Mm, mm. Mm, no. um, they go home and they tell their wives, like, honey, we are not going to their house. <sighs> Most of those men probably couldn't sleep that night. And they're like, boom. So, so here Jael, Hazor, um, Heber's wife, killed the general Sisera. And the glory of that, instead of going to Barak, it went to Jael, went to the wife, the woman, because Barak wouldn't do what God wanted him to do without a woman holding his hand. So, look, and this could have just as easily been turned around. It could have been the other way. could have been maybe Deborah was supposed to be the one, but God uh, tells her and she says, well, I won't go without that man, Barak. And then God gives the battle to Barak. But the, the story is this. The story is the willingness to step out in faith and do what God wants you to do. Sometimes you're going to be in places in your life where Things happen, and you're like, this is way, I have no idea what to do with this. I've never encountered anything like this. This is too big. I quit. And you're going to have that same attitude that Barak had, where he's like, um, I can't handle this. I need somebody to help me. Can I just get somebody to, to, to pray for me? Or can I just get somebody to, to loan me some money? Or whatever you need to get out of the, the situation that you're like, I can't handle this. The, Sometimes God just wants you to trust Him and act like you trust Him. Um, old story that I heard. There's a man walking along on a mountain path. And he gets a little too close to the edge. He steps on the side and it just crumbles out from underneath him. He starts falling off the cliff. And he grabs a branch on the way down. Okay, Some of you might have heard this. It's old. Okay, And he's standing there holding on for dear life. Just dangling. And he comes, he's just crying for help. And nobody answers. And he's crying for, for what seemed like hours. And he's just, help, help, help. And finally, he hears a voice. And he's like, who's up there? And he's holding on for dear life. And he says, and the voice comes back. It says, it's God. And he says, go, oh, thank God. Will you help me? And God says, yes, I'll help you. And he says, do you trust me? And the man says, yes, I trust you. You're God, of course I trust you. Hanging on for dear life. And God says, do you really trust me? He's like, yes, I just need help. Please help me. And God says, okay, let go of the branch. Is anybody else up there? We say we trust God. We, we can say, God, I trust you. And then we act like, uh, anybody else want to help? Because I don't really want to do that. Yes, options. Just want to keep my options open. By the way, if you're ever dangling from a branch for dear life, there aren't a whole lot of options, okay? Yeah, that's one. Um, now, um, so God does, God does rescue Israel. But because Barak behaved like he didn't really trust God. Yeah, I, I'll go. I believe God can do it. Uh, Deborah, come with me. That's not trusting God. That's uh, I need someone else to help. Moral support. Okay? So God gives the victory to Israel. Let's look at those verses. The last two verses of the chapter. 
23 and 24. God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. So on that day, the Bible says God subdued him. That's like under the thumb. Like put him down. But over time, he allowed Israel to prosper and grow more and get stronger until they finally just, done. They got rid of him. Okay? So, these uh, the heroes in these chapters and in the chapters to come all have something in common. Now, whether it's Othniel or uh, Shamgar or Ehud or Deborah or Barak, these people have a couple of things in common. The first thing is that they're kind of forced into action to rescue Israel because Israel had gone into sin. So Israel is actively being punished for their sin. Eight years, 18 years, 20 years, slow learners. And so they're forced into action because God hears the cries of Israel. They finally repented and God decides to rescue them. So these judges have to, have to come around and do great things because... Israel had sinned. The second thing that they all have in common is that they're, they're filled with God's Spirit. They're enabled to do things that they couldn't normally do. Now, what this means for us is, number one, uh, my mom always put it this way, keep short sin accounts. You know what an account is? Think in, in terms of bank account. The more you put into the bank account, and not take any out the more you put into it the more you have in the bank account right it grows you get more money um i was doing uh some compound interest tables because i have nerdy moments and um i was looking at if if we were to put money in this kind of account and if it got this much interest over this much time we'd have this much money because it would grow over time and so i was i was kind of geeking out on that a little bit lately and uh, the more you have in the account, the more you keep putting into the account, the more the account grows, right? Well, the same in the negative aspect is true with sin. The more and the longer you allow sin to fester in your heart, the longer you, like when you do something wrong, the longer you wait to confess and repent of that sin, or the more times you do that over time, the larger the account grows. And the more that wall between you and your Heavenly Father grows. And sin really is a separating wall between us and God. Jesus Christ came to earth to break down that wall. To die on the cross to forgive those sins. So that those sins don't have to be a barrier between God and us. To get rid of it. So, the first thing we need to learn is to keep small Sin accounts. When we sin, get that taken care of, cleared out of the account as quickly as possible so that it doesn't separate us from God. Otherwise, we end up getting in these gigantic problems like Israel was getting in. We end up, um, and no, nobody's probably going to come with a chariot and conquer you personally. But the effect on your life will be the same. When you're separated, when you have a wedge driven between you and God. The effect is, is that metaphor there on your life, on your spiritual life. The second is that the child of God, okay, here number two, the child of God, when you accept Christ as your Savior, you are given what the Bible calls the gift of the Holy Spirit. You are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. He comes and He takes up residence in your heart and in your life to guide you and to empower you. Okay? Guidance and power. I'm a car person. Okay? So here's where I go. Um, we were talking, a couple of us were talking, um, about the new Lamborghinis and Ferraris and, you know, the most powerful cars on earth. Okay? And I love, I, I have magazines that come to my house. I just love these cars. Okay? And... You know, the, the new Ferrari has like 950 horsepower. The Lamborghini, 740 horsepower. I mean, these, these are just numbers in a car that weren't even possible 30 years ago, okay? And so these cars have all kinds of power. What does that do for the cars? What does it help them do? Okay, it helps those cars 
get all Ricky Bobby. I'm going fast! Okay? You know what I'm talking about? So, those cars, when you press the happy pedal, that's the one on the right, it gets loud and you go fast, right? That's the power. Now, these days, a lot of cars, and if you have old cars like mine, then they don't have this, but if you have a lot of the newer cars, instead of a radio, what do they have? They have that little touch screen right in the middle there. And it does everything. It controls the air conditioning. It controls the radio. And it has the GPS. And little maps of stuff come up all over the place. And you can look at all kinds of different things that you've never been to because it's right there in the dashboard. Personally, I don't think drivers should be able to have that where they can reach it. So that, that little touch screen in the middle of the car, that's to guide them to places where they don't know where to go. Right? Like, give me an address. And what people say, th this kind of conversation happens, especially a lot when someone moves to a different area. You say, hey, do you know where this person lives? No, but just give me their address. I can put it in my... GPS. So, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. But what does it do? You type the address into your GPS or in your car's dashboard there, and as you get close to a turn, it tells you, hey, dummy, turn. Right? It tells you where to go so that you can get to the place you're wanting to go. That's the guidance. Now, the power and the guidance, car terms. One gives you the strength, the power to go, and sometimes to go fast. Okay, now, I have, I have owned cars. When my wife and I were first, when we were first dating, I had a, uh, a 1989 Ford Escort EXP. Ford Escort EXP, okay? This was supposed to be the sporty Escort. The thing had, like, half a horsepower, okay? When you pushed the happy pedal, it got really loud, but that's about it. The people behind you are like, did he push the gas pedal? What is he doing? Um, so, I mean, the thing was, uh, it was, it was pitiful. But some, some cars have lots of power. Okay, I'm talking Lamborghini, Ferrari. Some, some even lesser cars. Okay, um, there are some cars that are nice and have lots of power. Then there are cars like my Escort. So... But the, the idea is God gives you the power to go the places he wants you to go, to, to get into the things he needs you to get into. Like Deborah and Barak, he asked them to fight against this great king and his great army. And he was giving them the power to do it. Then he also gives guidance. Now we're getting into the GPS idea, right? And so he tells them how to go about doing these things. He said, I mean, if you look back through chapter 4, uh, Deborah tells Barak exactly where to go. Go down to Mount Tabor. Go down by this river. And that's where, you know, he had to follow those directions. What if he had decided, well, I don't want to go there. I'm going to go over there. Then the army of Sisera probably would have been able to take him by surprise. Completely wipe him out. So he had to go in the power of God, but exactly follow the directions of God. So it's the power and it's the direction of God. He empowers us and He enables us and He guides us. In, in our lives, practically, that means He gives us the power to do what's right and He shows us how to do what's right. And a lot of that showing us how is right here. So, you know, I mean, if you don't look at the road map, how are you going to know what road to turn on? If you never turn the GPS on, how are you going to know where to make the turn? If you're, well, I just know. Well, I mean... There are places you've never been before. No, it's been all around the world. The whole every world, Every huh? street, every corner. That's amazing. Every um, house, every Now, street. okay. Focus. We're almost done. So, so this is the story of the book of Judges. Israel sins, they're conquered, they repent, they're delivered. This is the cycle. Okay, And this is the story of God constantly saving Israel from themselves. They sin against God. God has to punish them. Then they repent, and God delivers them. So, 
in our lives, if we're not careful, we might not even see it, but we find ourselves in that same kind of pattern. We do wrong things, and God has to bring punishment into our lives. And then we finally realize, hopefully sooner, not later, that we shouldn't be doing those things, and God forgives us. And then we repeat the cycle. You know, if we remain close to Him, if we read the roadmap and figure out what it is we're supposed to do and what it is we're not supposed to do, and we allow the Holy Spirit of God to tell us, you know, kind of guide us toward good things and away from wrong things, then we won't find ourselves all through the pattern that the Israelites went through in, their, uh, in all of their escapades with um, struggling with this cycle right here. As soon as I can get back to it. They, uh, we won't find ourselves going through the cycle like this. The closer we are to God, the more we realize right away when we're slipping into something wrong. And we won't have to come down into the, the punishment part of the circle. Um, this stuff constantly reminds me of my children. It's a lot easier for them to do what's right when I'm standing there looking at them. Because they'll, they'll maybe start to do something, they'll look and, oh, oh, yeah, I won't do that. They see me, and all of a sudden, they're righteous. It's like, oh, I, I, was, I wasn't even close to doing that. I was not even thinking it. So, it's a lot easier to do, okay, I'll just, I'll just pick on myself here for a second. It's a lot easier to do the speed limit when the cop is in the lane right next to you. Or, it's easier to get the ticket when you fly by the cop that's in the yes, lane next to you. Yeah. yeah. That's not the spot that you're in. Um, <laughs> now, when, when the, uh, the person enforcing the law is right there, it's a lot easier to abide by the law. Yeah, it is. When, when we remain, when we consciously make an effort to keep ourselves close to God, it'll be a lot easier to do the things that God approves of. Does that make sense? When you keep yourself close to the one who wrote the rules, it's easier to abide by the rules. In basketball, you can't get away with nearly as much stuff when the ref is standing right there. You can't punch the dude in the face and not get, get like chucked out of the game for it. You're out of here! Okay? You... So if you... If the desire of, of a Christian is, because it should be, if the desire of a Christian is and should be to be like Christ, then wouldn't it make sense to stay close to Christ? Spiritually, we need to be in His Word. Physically, we need to be in places where right things are going on. It's the same kind of principle why you don't go to the bar to tell people about Jesus because you know, most, where do you get drunk? <laughs> okay? Um, we remain close to Him so we can do things that honor Him. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank You for the evening You've given to us. Thank You for the guidance from Your Word. God, I pray that we can learn from the, uh, the cycle and the, the punishment of the Israelites so that we can remain closer to You, so that we can do what's right. Help us, Lord, to do what's right. Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know You as their Savior, they've never trusted You to forgive their sins and give, you, give them a home in heaven, Lord, I pray that they would get that matter settled tonight in their hearts. Lord, we'll thank You for all the things that You're going to do. Take us home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, I love you guys. I'll see you next week.